We use the opening dialogue and hymn verses from Onward Christian Soldiers that are printed in your worship folder. I invite you all to stand and we'll begin our Palm Sunday worship with this dialogue and singing. In this place, on this day, we join in a victory parade for Christ has entered here. Savior. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. As we sing hosannas with the crowd that entered Jerusalem with Jesus that first Palm Sunday, we recognize it was for our sake that he came to suffer for our sins. Let us confess our sins to him. Dear Lord Jesus, it is for our sake that you came to this earth to live and die on our behalf. Forgive us for the times we hail you as our king in the safety of friends, but are quick to betray you when the pressure is on. Forgive us when out of the same mouth comes our praise of you, and then words of cursing. With repentant hearts we fall before you pleading, Lord, have mercy on us sinners. With humble hearts we ask you to hear us, as we confess to you. The thief on the cross asked Jesus to remember him when he came into heaven. Jesus did. The soldiers and religious leaders sinned unknowingly against Jesus, yet Jesus said, 
Father, forgive them. It is the same mercy and grace that Jesus now gives to you. For sins known or unknown, he speaks to you. You are forgiven. For comfort and certainty that your sins no longer separate you from God, he says, you will be with me in paradise. Receive this promise of forgiveness with a heart of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. With hearts cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, let us respond with joyful praise. O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms in his path, so, we, so may we also hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning from the Old Testament prophet Zechariah is he foretells of this aspect of Jesus' life, one who had come riding into Jerusalem to the shouts of the people, coming riding on a donkey in humility. From Zechariah chapter 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, daughter of Jerusalem! See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow, bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. The choir will now offer an anthem of praise, come and see. Thank you. 
Our second lesson is the Gospel record of Palm Sunday, recorded by the Gospel writer Mark, in the 11th chapter. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of the Lord. lot and honor.
us pray. All glory, laud, and honor to you, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet Hosanna's ring. As you receive their praises, accept the prayers we bring, O source of every blessing, our good and gracious King. Lord, as you rode into Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna, to the shouts of hail as King, Lord, ride into our hearts that we might see you for who you really are, our Savior, our King, our Lord. Bless the preaching of your word. Bless the hearing of your word this morning, Lord, that we might be built up in our faith, encouraged and strengthened through it. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite those who will be participating in Kids Church to head over to the Kids Church area. I invite the rest of you to pick out the salmon-colored insert on which are the message notes that are printed for today. Also to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. brothers and sisters in Christ, subjects of our Palm Sunday King, the Lord Jesus. What do you see? If you look at your message notes or you look on the screen, you probably have seen some of these optical illusions where someone has asked, what do you see? Do you see the young woman, or do you see the old woman? If you're looking at the old woman, you see her eye, which is also the ear of the young woman. The wart on the nose of the old woman is the petite nose of the young woman. Do you see it? Be distracted the whole sermon now. The mouth on the old woman is the necklace on the young woman. Once you see them both, your eyes kind of shift one to the other. Well, how about the next one? What do you see? A duck or a rabbit? The duck facing to the left with its bill open, or the rabbit facing to the right with its ears behind it. What do you see? The third one, what do you see? A Native American or an Eskimo? The head of a Native American facing to the left, or an Eskimo peering into the darkness. With the nose of the Native American, the left arm, the back side of the Eskimo. What do you see? It would have been interesting to see how long it would take you to figure those out if I didn't give you a few clues along the way. I did put the other kind of optical illusion that probably has frustrated some of you in countless, for countless minutes or countless hours, and maybe some of you have just given up, those ones that are just a, a picture of different patterns and you have to kind of look through to see that image pop out. These optical illusions, the more you look at them, like I said, if you see both, your eyes shift from one to the other. Or if you're not sure what you're looking for, you may never see the other part of it. And so as we think about Palm Sunday, what do, we, what do these optical illusions have to do with Palm Sunday? That as we see this individual, whom we call Jesus, riding into Jerusalem, what do you see? What do you see riding on that colt, the foal of the donkey? And we say, well, we see Jesus. Great. That's where we start. But what else do we see riding on that donkey, riding into Jerusalem? 
Because as we look at the, the image that Mark described, we read earlier of Jesus and his disciples following on this donkey, screwing their cloaks before him, palm branches, people shouting, Hosanna, hail to the king of David. What do you see? And I would guess if you are one of those members of the crowd, you see something different. Maybe you'd see Jesus for who he really was. Maybe you saw the beginning of the rise of Israel as the national power again. Maybe you would see the kingdom of God. Maybe you'd see the kingdom of God on earth. What do you see? And still as we look at Jesus today, what do we see? And do we clearly see who Jesus really is? The Apostle Paul, as he wrote the letter to the Philippians, helped us understand a little bit more who this Jesus was, who he is. That as we look back on the events of Palm Sunday and see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, we can have a clear picture in our mind's eye of who he really is. Please look at your Bibles with me, Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 5. Paul, through inspiration, writes, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, what does this help us see? Well, let's put ourselves back in that crowd on Palm Sunday, and we see this individual who we've heard about, maybe we've spent some time with, called Jesus, riding into Jerusalem. Well, what do you see? On the surface, you probably see a man. A man who is a great teacher, one that I would call rabbi. One that spoke with authority. I saw a man who had great influence. He helped those that were downtrodden. Maybe couldn't help themselves. He was a great moral teacher. Helped me understand the law of God in a more complete and full way. Who was this Jesus riding into town? My first perception would be that he's a true man. A man on a mission. And maybe in the back of my Hebrew, my Jewish mindset, is now is the time for the kingdom of Israel to be restored. And Jesus, I do believe he is the Messiah, but have a mistaken idea of what that Messiah was going to do. Here's the man that's going to be the conquering hero, riding into Jerusalem, kick out the Romans, establish Israel as a na national power. And the state of Israel is national prominence. National prominence. For many watching Jesus ride into Jerusalem, they probably just had a vision of him or a picture of him as a man on a mission. And you can understand how probably many of them towards the end of the week as the trial of Jesus unfolds and his suffering unfolds and eventually he's hung on a cross, you understand why people might be sorely disappointed. That this man that they hailed as king was not going to be the king they thought he was going to be. How about us? When we look at Jesus, do we see his humanity sign? Do we see him as a man and maybe at times nothing more? But we certainly acknowledge that he is true man. He wept, he slept, he ate, he drank. He interacted with people. But sometimes that's all the credibility we or others give him. He was a great man, a great prophet, even outstanding among all prophets, outstanding among all teachers. He teaches us great morals to live by. He was one that helped those down and out. We should follow his example. He's one that had influence on the people. He was a great leader. We can learn great leadership from Jesus. We can learn great moral teaching from Jesus. We can... We can learn great ways to interact with society and bring up the downtrodden. 
You see, if we only look at Jesus as true man, those are the things we're going to see. That's all we're going to see in Jesus. If that's the perspective that we're holding, that he was just a great man among men, we'll be sorely disappointed. When he doesn't carry out everything that we expect from him, where he realized that even if we follow all his moral teaching, it's far too short before the Lord God Almighty. Even if we help people with all their social injustices, we've missed the main point in their biggest need. You see, at times we can carry a perspective that Jesus is just a great man. But as we peer more deeply into what we see riding into Jerusalem and we look at the, the words of, of Paul, that this man who rode into Jerusalem is much more, who in being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, and even death on a cross. You see that the individual we call Jesus riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, as we look more closely as how the Bible describes him, this is true God, who gave up his divine power and authority for a time to come and live among us. This wasn't just an individual from natural descent that came and rose to prominence and had his moment on the scene and then left. No, this was an individual whom God, God made flesh, God dwelling among us to be part of God's eternal plan. John in his first letter writes, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him and who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. You see, the Apostle Paul helps us understand and see Jesus as he's riding in, into Jerusalem on a donkey. Yes, as true man, but also as true God. God who had given up a portion of, for a time, his divine powers, his divine qualities, to live among us. Why? Why would God become flesh? Why would God make his dwelling among us? Why would God become true man? So that we might see in him true man, true God. Why is that so important? Why is it important to see both sides interacting so closely knit together? Well, look at Psalm 49 on the back side of your message notes. Does no man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. You see, if we move past the needs we have on this earth and understand that our greatest need in life is to be right with God and to understand where we're going after this life is over and understand that what heaven is and how do we get there? We understand that God owns heaven, lives in heaven, is the one who determines who is there. And God the Father demands perfection. He says, be perfect as I, the Lord your God, am perfect. And he says, everyone who sins just at one point of the law is guilty of breaking all of it. So we all fall in that category of falling short of meeting God's requirements. And as much as I would like to, I cannot do enough for myself or for any member of my family or for any member of this congregation to earn that favor with God. The psalm writer told me that. No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him, for the ransom for life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. This payment for sin was too great. But that's what Jesus came riding into Jerusalem for. He had to be true man to live in my place and be on this earth. He had to be true God so that he would be perfect in my place. 
He had to be true man so that he could suffer and die. He had to be true God that that suffering and death might count for the sins of all. That's what Paul in his writing to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 19, is God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. You see, on the surface, it's easy to see Jesus' human side. It's easy to see him as a great teacher, a great moral leader, but he is also true God. And the interaction of those two natures is vital for our salvation. And understanding that he's more than just a man is of utmost importance. For as true God, he lived perfectly for me. As true God, his payment counted for everybody. And as true God, he rose again victoriously. I pray this is your conviction. That when you see Jesus riding into Jerusalem, or any time you think of Jesus, you think of him as true God and true man. One who humbled himself to die, even death on the cross, Paul said. But then also true God, whom God would exalt. But that's not the belief of everybody. Not everybody sees Jesus as true God and true man. Some see him just as a prophet. Someone to respect. Someone to look up to. Someone is their example for living and life. That's all fine and well, but they're missing the biggest point. Of Jesus as Savior. And for us who hold the conviction that Jesus is true God and true man... That's the message we have the opportunity to share. To help people see that he is true God and true man and the significance of them both. If I stared at Jesus long enough on that donkey just with my own eyes, all I'd see is a man riding into Jerusalem for some noble purpose that maybe I understood or maybe I didn't understand. You see, and it's God's word, that gospel message, that changes our eyes to shift our perspective to see he is also true God and true man. And just like those images we showed earlier, once you see them both, your eyes kind of shift back and forth, but they're all part of one image. So it is in the two natures of Christ. We see at times his true humanity as he lived and interacted with people, ate, slept, wept, drank, cried, we see his divinity as he raised the dead, healed the sick, raised himself from the dead, taught with authority, lived perfectly. But in the end, it's one image that we see. Jesus, true God and true man. Now, if I look at that picture again, what do I see? One who is exalted, one who is humbled. Maybe I flip back to one who is exalted again. The Apostle Paul and his writing, he speaks of the humility and the humiliation of Jesus. Did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Became obedient to death, even death on a cross. But that's not what people first saw. They weren't carrying Jesus on Palm Sunday out to Golgotha to hang him on a cross. They were hailing him as king. If I first viewed that perspective, I would see one who is greatly exalted or about to be exalted at the minimum. One who is going to establish the throne of David. That's exaltation, isn't it? That's raising someone up. Moving the individual from someone from Nazareth. Remember, can anything good come from Nazareth? To a great teacher, great miracle worker, just coming off raising Lazarus from the dead. Now he's riding into Jerusalem. The next thing is a kingdom for me to be a part of. You remember James and John's request of Jesus? Jesus, when you establish your kingdom, the mom said, let one of my boys sit on your right and the other one sit on your left in your glory. I bet there were others on Palm Sunday who had visions of the messianic kingdom that Jesus was going to come to establish and their role in it be one of position, of power, the Romans would get kicked out. I would have peace, as Zechariah referred to it. Peace on this earth only, though. I would have people serve me. 
boy, this is going to be great to be part of the kingdom of God that Jesus is going to establish. And maybe at times our perspective is similar. Where we see to be a Christian, to be part of God's kingdom is going to be great. All my needs are going to be taken care of. If we buy into some preaching that God doesn't want any poor people, I'm going to be rich. That I'll have no more trouble or heartache. That if I'm connected with Jesus, all my problems go away. But then, if I hold a perspective that all it means to be part of Christ, to be a Christian, is to experience all the good things on this earth. How sorely disappointed and disillusioned I have been. And how disappointed I'm going to be when things crash around me. And if I'm one of those individuals who hailed him as king and had this idea that God is, going, is now establishing his messianic kingdom through Christ, and then just a few days later, I see Jesus standing before me being beaten and scourged. And those around me saying, crucify him, crucify him. And then just a few hours later, him being elevated on a cross with common criminals, the worst of criminals. What am I going to think? What happened? I thought I was going to live in the glory of God's kingdom. But Jesus' humiliation points out to us, as we've mentioned a few Sundays now, that the life of a Christian, the life of Christ, is not the life of the couch, but it's the life of the cross. And Jesus pointed out in his humiliation, as he became obedient to death, even death on a cross, as Matthew wrote, as Jesus spoke, and Matthew recorded in Matthew chapter 20, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was humbled, took the way of the cross for you and for me. He wasn't here to establish an earthly kingdom. He wasn't here to give us all the comforts of life that we might grow secure and comfortable in living on this earth. He wasn't here to make us part of his family that we might have all the success in the world but he came to serve us that we might be exalted in the same way, similar way that he was. Not on this earth, but eternally in heaven. And that's what Paul gets at as he records, once his humiliation had been complete and his work of saving mankind finished, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, <laughs> And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, for those people there on Palm Sunday, yes, they must have been disappointed as that kingdom on earth wasn't established. And to be honest with you, there's still people waiting for a kingdom on earth to be established. They've missed the point. They saw Jesus riding into Jerusalem to establish that kingdom, and then when it didn't happen, they lost hope. But see, as we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem, not to establish a kingdom on earth, to be part of his humiliation, to establish his heavenly kingdom and to bring us all there. Then we can also rejoice in his exaltation as God lifted him up again. Remember, he had set aside part of his, his, divi or his divine qualities, divine power for a time. Now God raises him up. The first part of that is he is raised from the dead on Easter Sunday to show he had power over death. And then 40 days later, as God raised him back into heaven and seated him at his right hand, and where we will see his ultimate glory and power eye to eye, face to face, is either when, we, when the Lord takes us to heaven and we see it, or we're still here remaining and the Lord returns in all his glory. Then we will see a majestic, almighty, powerful king coming. And, as Paul said, every Gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. You see, 
the significance of Jesus' exaltation to us and to the entire world is many fold. But let me just take those three events that I just mentioned, his resurrection. This differentiates Jesus from any other religious leader of all times. You can go find their grave. You only find an empty tomb with Jesus. It gives credibility to all he came to say and do. Prove that his payment for sin was enough as God the Father received him back. Proved his victory over sin, death, and the devil. Fulfilled the promise that would crush the power of Satan. Why is that significant to us? If Christ had not been raised, our faith is futile. We're still in our sins. But indeed, Christ has been raised. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ's resurrection proves that we too will rise. Christ's resurrection proves to the world that he is who he said he was. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only hope of heaven. His ascension, as he ascended to the right hand of God, why is that significant to us? Because as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he now rules the world on the behalf of his people, the church. He controls all the affairs of the world, even though we don't see them at times, how they're working to the good of God's kingdom. We have that confidence that they are. And how will his return be significant to all? Well, it's at that point that there's no one, no one will be able to deny who Jesus is. All will have to acknowledge him as the Son of God. God's revelation to John in chapter 1, looking forward to that time of Christ's return, he says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, referring to Christ, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, not a kingdom on this world, but a kingdom in heaven. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. God's desire is that before he returns, everyone sees him for who he really is. True man, true God, humbled to serve us, exalted, victorious, that we might also be victorious. Not all do. People will stare into the pages of Scripture and not get it. People will need us to explain. Us to give them the clues to help them see who Jesus really is. That's what God has put us here for. And as we move into Holy Week, there is no clearer preaching of this gospel message than to see Jesus suffer, die, and rise again. That's all happening in the next week. There are people who are looking into the pages of Scripture. They're looking into the world around. They're looking for spiritual meaning and significance. They're looking for answers. They're looking to see life as God really intended life to be seen. They're looking to know what happens after this life. And they're not going to see it until the gospel message transforms them. And God uses us to help them see that. The last image that is on your page. I pray it's just a simple reminder of what God's Word has shared with us today to see Jesus for who He really is. If you want to stare at the one on the screen or stare at the one on your sheet for about 15 seconds. And once you've done that, just close your eyes and just slightly tilt your head back. See him? Image of Jesus' face. You can try it. If you don't see it right away, it doesn't mean you see don't see Jesus for who he really is. But a little visual reminder that as we peer into the pages of Scripture, we are so thankful that the Lord Jesus 
The Spirit of God has opened our eyes to see him for who he really is. True man, true God, humbled to serve us, that we might be exalted with him for an eternity. This is who we see riding into Jerusalem. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus now and to eternity. Amen. We'll join in making confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. They're printed on your worship folder, page 6. Please stand as we make our confession. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this point, we invite all to sign our friendship register as a record of your time with us this morning. We'll be gathering our gifts and offerings for the Lord's work here and abroad. Sunday on behalf of us all and the special intercessions this morning. We'll continue to keep in our prayers little Alexander Saltzgaber for his uh, continued growth and strengthening. We also include in our prayers our, our sister Lynn Sarver, who yesterday suffered a momentary loss of memory, and she's at Western Wake um, for the time being as they run uh, tests to see what might have caused that. We'll lift those up to the Lord in prayer. Please stand. Lord Jesus, you are the King of heaven and earth. We join the first Palm Sunday worshipers in praising and glorifying you for coming to this earth to be our Savior. Though you are one with God the Father and Lord of all, you humbled yourself and became one with us. Thanks be to you for living a life of perfect conformity to God's holy law in our place. Praise be to you for being obedient to death, even death on a cross, to redeem us from sin. Cause our voices to blend with those who sang your praises as you rode into Jerusalem. Move us to confess you before others as our Lord. Help us proclaim the message of peace and forgiveness to people of all nations. Use us to assure all people that your blood has cleansed them from sin and set them free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil. Move us all to dedicate all we are and have to your glory. Lord Jesus, you are king over all the earth. 
Bless the nations of this world with wise rulers and good government. Let peace prevail. Grant success to the businesses and industries of our land to serve for the common good. Cause all employers to be honest and fair-minded with all employees to be diligent and faithful. Look with favor on our nation's schools. Be with those who teach and those who learn. Comfort the sick and the afflicted with the assurance of your care and protection. Strengthen the faith of the dying. Lord, this morning we ask you to grant your healing and protecting hand to two of your dear children. We continue to ask you to look with favor on little Alexander Saltzgaver. Continue to strengthen and grow his body that he might be able to have the necessary procedure done to continue his growing and healing process. We thank you for the progress he has made and patiently await your time for him to be healed and come home to grow up with his family. Be with his parents, Teresa and Scott, with an extra measure of your patience and comforting hand to know you hold them and little Alexander in your watchful care. This morning we also ask you to be with Lynn Sarver, who experienced an undiagnosed memory loss yesterday. Give the doctors wisdoms to pin, wisdom to pinpoint the cause and apply appropriate, appropriate treatment. Use this as an opportunity for her and Mike and all of us to rely on you at all times for your gracious care of body and soul. Lord, you rode into Jerusalem to finish your work of saving us. We thank you for this. You ascended into heaven to rule all for your kingdom's blessing. Lord, we ask you to guide and bless the kingdom work that is being done here locally and around the world. Be with the leaders and administrators of our synod that they might provide spiritual direction to all our kingdom work. Give them patience and perseverance to be your instrument to move us through these challenging financial times as a synod that your kingdom work will not be curtailed. Locally, Lord, we ask your continued hand of guidance and direction with our ministry. Open our eyes this week to see someone who needs the message of this Holy Week. Use us to invite them to hear of you. We ask your continued blessing on our building effort. Grant efficiency and honesty to all the contractors and town officials involved. Grant time and willing hearts to our members to participate in the project. Grant stamina and perseverance to the many who have already given so much of their time. Allow us to complete the project as a testimony to your blessing and your saving grace. Hear us, Lord, as we individually bring you our private petitions. Dear Savior, as we walk with you this week toward Calvary, keep us focused on your purpose for coming into this world and on our calling to spread this wonderful message of salvation. Hear us for your mercy's sake. Amen. We also pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another, and serve your Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. one last time with the song let it be said of us
certainly welcome to all, especially those that are visiting this morning. We're certainly grateful that you're here. I invite everybody to enjoy some fellowship and refreshment before you head out with the rest of your day's activities. As I've already mentioned, a number of wonderful worship opportunities uh, this week, beginning Thursday night. There will not be a Wednesday night worship uh, this week. Thursday night, remember the institution of the Lord's Supper, Monday Thursday worship, with the celebration of Holy Communion. Then on Friday, a tenebrae service, a service of darkness, where we have uh, the seven candles and scripture lessons and a reminder of Jesus' work on our behalf on Good Friday at 7 o'clock. <clears throat> and then on Sunday, uh, 7 a.m., Easter sunrise worship opportunity, and then our celebration worship at 1030 with uh, breakfast in between. Along with the, the worship opportunities on Easter, there's a number of opportunities to be part of that day as well as leading up to that day. Uh, there are a couple sign-up sheets on the refreshment table, one for Easter flowers to just indicate if you have a spring flower to decorate the altar with um, for Easter morning. Um, Easter breakfast, there's a sign-up list there both to indicate how many of you or your family will be in attendance. Um, the leadership team will be providing pancakes, waffles, eggs, and bacon, and there are other items that can be brought, uh, juices, sides, muffins, etc. If you are as you are able and willing, please indicate that on the sheet as well. Then, um, we have had an Easter egg hunt in the past, and as of right now, do we have a coordination for that? Okay, so that will take place after breakfast. A um, number of different things you can use to invite your uh, acquaintances to our Easter worship. There are little business cards on the table to the left of the exit door. And along with that are little booklets called The Case for Easter. If people are questioning the validity of Jesus, and especially his resurrection, a great apologetical uh, writing or just a, a logical explanation why the resurrection is valid and true and believable. A uh, great resource uh, even for yourself, but also to share. And then um, <clears throat> there are some road signs that we've used in the past. If you have a property that has uh, some traffic driving by, uh, please take one of those and stick it in your yard this week uh, to let people know of our, our Easter worship. I think that hits the highlights with our, our Holy Week, and I, I pray that this, like I began the service, is just a, a meaningful time to your faith life to meditate and focus on what the Lord Jesus has done for us, especially in his, his suffering death and his glorious resurrection. <laughs> the facility continues. Uh, you see the updates there. One, one change, uh, thankfully, is we got a call last night from our heating and air contractor that he uh, will be able to to do the work and has uh, arranged for the working or the workers he needed. So we're grateful for that to uh, move forward with that piece of the project. Uh, just to, to make everybody aware that as we are putting together the a revised timeline, um, we're we're looking like we won't uh, make the end of May as far as a completion effort. The Lord can, can do miraculous things um, through us, um, but um, just to where the leadership team will be talking about alternatives for uh, some of the Sundays in June, and as of right now, we don't have a commitment from our landlord that we can move into June as far as using this space, so um, we'll be talking about that at our next leadership team meeting. Um, as, as the emails have gone out, and as you have time, either on Thursdays or Saturdays, uh, certainly um, as we put our hands together and, and put the effort into it, um, the, the sooner we'll be in it. So uh, some of the things are out of our control and we're not able to do, but certainly there are still uh, many, many projects that, that can be done. And see Mike Malone, Don Booker, uh, myself, if you're in need of a project. This Thursday night won't be a, a work night at the building. We'll set that aside for worship. Um, and Saturday, as you have time, you're certainly free to participate over there. Anything else in regard to the facility, Mike? Yeah, uh, thank you to those who were able to have a piece of work uh, this past week. Um, the, 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 the condo, getting rid of some of that condo, that way keeps the, our, our electrician going so we're not going up and down. And also, this, this uh, past Thursday, we even had some help from outside our congregation. Pastor Brother-in-law was able to, to come over and, and uh, 
slave, I mean willing labor. <laughs> if you were unable to participate in laying the foundation Sunday and writing your favorite passage somewhere in the building, there is still time and opportunity to do that. The materials are there at the building. Um, the, the key is on the left door above the door. Uh, just when it's convenient for you, the materials are on the water cooler that's in the entry area. Uh, just fill out a sheet and put it in my box when you've completed and uh, find bare wood is probably the safest uh, general directive and uh, put your passage there for us to remember and be part of our building. I'll let you read the other announcements uh, for yourself. Anything else for the congregation this morning? God bless your day and your holy week. Thank you.